Welcome to our Voting Rights Forum. We'll start in a minute or two and we'll play a short video clip. Okay, we'll now play a video showing League members, including the National League President, Dr. Deborah Ann Turner, and other League members who participated in a peaceful protest in front of the White House in November of last year. In the video, Dr. Turner emphasizes the importance of voting rights. Every person has to stand and defend voting rights. Voting should be for all people. Voting rights are under attack like we have not seen since the days of Jim Crow. Now is the time to ensure national standards that will protect and expand our access to the ballot. Mr. President, we demand voting rights now. There is no excuse to not pass voting rights reform. All other rights depend on the right to vote. It is the number one issue of our times at this moment. Get this done. What do we want? Just over 100 years ago, brave women stood on this very spot with much the same message that we deliver today. Full and equal voting rights for all. Women are going to lead the way. Stay with us. Follow the message. Keep on keeping on. And we are going to fight this good fight. Welcome to the League of Women Voters of Santa Barbara Forum. But fighting for voting rights then and now. You're probably wondering what happened to the protesters shown in the film clip. Over 200 of them, including Dr. Turner, were arrested and taken to jail. It's not like they were trying to storm the Capitol. It was a peaceful protest urging that laws that would restore the provisions of the Voting Rights Act be passed. It may, this stuff makes my head spin. Silvia Uribe of TranselPro is providing simultaneous interpretation in Spanish for this forum. The information in the slide on the screen shows how to access her interpretation. Closed captioning is also available for those who would like to use it. You can turn it on by clicking the live transcript icon at the bottom of your screen. Later, we will have a sneak peek of Beth Pitton August's wonderful new film, Just the Beginning, A Century of Political Power and the League of Women Voters. Please note that because Beth's film is still in projection, production, only people who registered to attend this meeting will be able to watch the sneak peek. Also, it will not be live streamed to our Facebook page or included in the recordings posted later on our website. I'm Rave Moran, Vice President for Voter Service of our league. I and my committee of volunteers are responsible for registering and educating voters. We hold candidate forums prior to each election for those running for office. This year, we'll have candidate forums for those running for state assembly, the Santa Barbara County Board of Supervisors, and Sheriff. Those forums will be held prior to the June primary election and the general election in November. See our events calendar on our website for more information. This forum is being co-sponsored by our friends at SBWPC, the Santa Barbara Women's Political Committee, and AAUW, the local chapter, the American Association of University Women. Thanks to both of them for their support. The forum is being recorded in both English and Spanish, and the recordings will be posted for later viewing via YouTube on our website. So look for that later. Before we start the program, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that the land we are on is part of the unceded territory of the Chumash people of Santa Barbara. We pay our respects to the Chumash elders, past, present, and future, who call this place their home. May we follow in your tradition of coming together and growing as a community. 
We thank the Shumash community for their stewardship and welcome their wisdom as we seek a healing path for all people and the earth. This year, the League of Women Voters is celebrating our 102nd anniversary. The League works at the national, state, and local level on issues of concern to our communities. The League believes in the power of women to create a more perfect democracy, a democracy where every person has the right knowledge and confidence to participate. Our local leg league is an all-volunteer nonprofit organization. Membership is open to anyone over 16 years of age. Please check out our website and join us if you're not already a member. This is our first community forum of 2022. A big thank you to our forum organizers, Vicki Allen, our VP for communications, Beth Pitton August, league member and filmmaker, and Pam Flint Tambo, our Vice President of Programs and Social Policy. I'd also like to acknowledge a few dignitaries who are attending today's meeting. Carol Moon Goldberg, President of the California State League, Kristen Snedden, Santa Barbara City Council Member for District 4, Kathy Murillo, a former Santa Barbara Mayor, and Sheila Lodge, also a former mayor. The issue of voting rights has been in the news a lot lately. The League strongly supported passage of the Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. Both of these laws would have restored many of the provisions of the 1965 Voting Rights Act that were struck down by the US Supreme Court in 2013 in the Shelby County versus Holder case. It also would have added additional protections against gerrymandering and helped decrease the influence of money in politics. Although neither bill was enacted, the league is still working at the national level to protect voting rights, including support for reforming the 1887 Electoral Count Act. There appears to be serious interest from both Democrats and Republicans in updating this law, but the effort is in its early stages and finalizing a bill would take weeks, if not months. At the state level, the situation varies greatly. In California, we're fortunate that there is a strong support for protecting voting rights. We have automatic voter registration, online registration, mail-in ballot, same-day registration, and support from the Secretary of State to make voting easier and more accessible to everyone. However, the picture is not as rosy in many other states. In the last two years, at least 19 states have enacted laws that make it harder for Americans to vote. For example, the Kansas State Legislature passed a law last year making it a felony to represent oneself as an election official or to knowingly engage in contact that gives the appearance of being an election official. A felony is the most serious category of crime. It includes things such as murder and armed ro robbery. These actions harken back to the era of the Jim Crow laws driven by racism and fear. As a result, all nine local leagues in Kansas have stopped registering voters, one of their core activities. The state league and other groups have filed a motion for temporary injunction against this new law. The president, co-president of their league stated, this law makes it a crime for the league to do our most basic and most important work. You will hear more about these types of actions in other states from our speakers. So let's move on to their presentations. During the presentations, I invite you all to add your questions to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please indicate which speaker you would like to address your question. After all three speakers have completed their presentations, we will address as many of your questions as time allows. Because our time for questions is short, we probably will not get to all of your questions. We will, however, provide contact information for the speakers so that you can follow up with them later. Our first speaker is the president of the Georgia State League, Susanna Scott. Ms. Scott is a native Georgian who was raised in a politically active family that regularly discussed public policy and local government at the dinner table. 
a graduate of Mount Holyoke College. Susanna has a Juris Doctorate degree from Georgia State University College of Law and a Master's of Law from Trinity College, Dublin. Her master's thesis explored the development of the right to vote in England and the United States. She firmly believes in the League's vision of a democracy where every person has the desire, the right, the knowledge, and the confidence to participate. Welcome, Ms. Scott. Thank you so much. I appreciate being invited here. Um, I'm coming to you all from Atlanta, Georgia, which are the historic lands of the Muscogee and the Cherokee tribes. So I want to give pay for respect to them as well. Um, here in Georgia, we are one of the uh, first states last year to start really um, pushing to have some very restrictive voting rights bills um, or legislation um, in the country. Um, I will say one of the things that we've been proud of here in Georgia is that we are one of the early adopters of the motor voter law and that we were an early adopter of um, no excuse absentee voting. So we've had both of those in place for a number of years. Um, and, and again, it's something we've been very, very proud of. In the wake of the 2020 election um, and the pandemic, which really required people or necessitated most people to um, vote absentee in order to stay safe, um, our Georgia legislature implemented a number, well, one law um, that was 98 pages long um, that covered and affected voting access and voting rights for the entire state in a number of ways. Um, the first thing they did was to um, it's a good thing they decided that every county in the state of Georgia has to have um, absentee ballot drop boxes. Um, in 2020, that was not a requirement. And there was at least one county in our 159 counties that opted to not have any absentee ballot drop boxes in their counties. Um, and so SB 202 actually requires every county to have one. However, they restricted the number of absentee ballot boxes that each county could have. So every county has to have at least one, but they can have no more than one box for every 100,000 registered voters. So in very populous counties like Fulton County, which is the seat of um, Atlanta and DeKalb County, which is its neighbor, um, they went from 38 and 31 ballot boxes around the counties respectively to eight and six, I think, or seven. So it's had a huge impact on the number of the absentee ballot boxes that are allowed. Um, the other thing they've done, um, it's, again, it's good. They, they said that every county can have early voting um, on Sundays, which has been something that has been attempted to be outlawed over the last few years um, because of you know, very strong um, souls to the polls pushes here in Georgia. They, they've now said that they're allowed, but they did not mandate them. And they don't mandate that you have early voting on weekends, um, every weekend during the three week cycle. So um, they've also restricted the, the hours um, and made that a little bit harder. The other thing that they, I forgot to say about the absentee about the drop boxes is that they've gone from being outside, monitored 24 hours a day, by video surveillance to being inside buildings only accessible from seven to seven or when the offices that they're located inside are open. And um, this really, as we're still in a pandemic, um, as much as we might wish we were not, this impacts people's ability to um, drop off their ballots in a safe manner. Um, and it also inconveniences people who um, work um, shift work and maybe can't get to that ballot box until two o'clock in the morning. So I mean, it, those things have also had an impact. They have also banned um, providing food and water at polling locations, either during early voting or on election day. Um, one of the legislators who added this language to SB 202 claimed that his polling place, which is in a majority white district, um, there was never a line. He never had to wait more than 20 minutes to vote. 
but that's not the lived reality for people in you know, metro areas, um, especially um, when there's a high volume of people of color voting at a particular precinct. So that is one um, concern is that um, in areas where we have seen, even in 2020, lines that can last up to eight hours, um, people are not allowed to bring food or water to help you know, provide sustenance to those people waiting in line to exercise their constitutional right to vote. On top of that, they put in a lot of um, changes to the system to make it harder to administer um, elections and easier for state control, um, state takeover of local election districts. So um, they now require that all absentee ballots be printed on specialized paper that will cost counties you know, um, an unknown amount of money. And it's the reason it's unknown is because they refuse to do a study to determine what the fiscal impact of this law would be on counties. So um, it makes it harder for counties to budget properly um, and, and to ensure that you know, they're meeting the law because they have to have this paper um, in small counties, uh, rural counties that don't necessarily have the funds of bigger counties like Fulton and DeKalb, gonna have a harder time um, finding money in their budget to accommodate this requirement. Um, they also um, changed the timeframes for um, when you can request an absentee ballot and when it has to be returned by. Um, so the absentee ballot request period prior to 2021, um, you could requ uh, request a ballot 180 days before an election and up to four days before the election. So it gave people a really long period of time in which to determine whether or not they were going to be able to make an in-person in appearance at the polls or if they needed that absentee ballot. Um, that time has been shortened to 78 days before the election um, and to 11 days before the election. And we saw in the municipal elections this past year, um, this past November, over 52% of ballot application or absentee ballot request applications were rejected because they were sent in the four to 11 days period before the elections that people had traditionally taken advantage of. Um, and they had no recourse if they were out of town. They had no recourse if they were sick and could not go to the poll safely. Um, and again, 52% of I mean, rejected ballots is a, I mean, a pretty large number. So it's had an impact on that. We did see um, rejections on the front end as well. A lot of our seniors who have long taken advantage of the early um, absentee ballot option like to send in those requests 180 days ahead of time because they know if they do it then, they get to check a little box and say, I want all of my ballots sent to me absentee for the selection cycle and they don't have to worry about it anymore. So a lot of those ballots were rejected as well. Luckily, they had the option of resubmitting their request in that 78 day time period. Um, so they did not lose their ability to, but it disrupted their cycle and their, their comfort with how the process has previously worked. Um, and I, I spoke to the fact that there was election takeover options now in the state um, under SB 202. And now um, legislators can, um, they can complain about their board of elections or their election supervisor. Um, County commissioners can do it as well, or the state um, secretary of state's office can complain and uh, create an investigation into either the board or the supervisor, um, which can lead to their removal from office. So when an investigation begins, if they are investigating the board or a board member, that person can be removed. Okay. Um, if they're investigating the supervisor, they can be suspended and replaced with someone of the Secretary of State's office or the Board of State Board of Elections, um, whoever they choose. Um, and, and this is a really big issue. And one we're, uh, we think we're going to be seeing happening in the Metro Atlanta area, where uh, again, right now they're democratically held counties. Um, the majority of the residents there are Democrats, but if a Republican legislator, legislator who represents that county 
um, wants to, they can file a complaint against the election supervisor or the board of elections and have them suspended pending an investigation. During that time period, the county is on the hook for both the suspended, in terms of a, a supervisor, the suspended supervisor's salary, as well as the interim supervisor's salary. Um, and if the investigation determines that no wrongdoing has been done and that the supervisor has to be reinstated, the county also is on the hook for um, their legal defense fees. So this, again, with no investigation into the fiscal impact on counties, will have a huge impact on counties. And we're anticipating um, that something like this might happen for Fulton County and other counties to follow, depending on how successful that is. So um, this is a way for the party in power to remove democratically selected board, election board members or you know, properly hired election supervisors if they don't like how, um, how a county votes and can, it, it creates a lot of concern about how, um, how county boards will function going forward. It makes it hard, I think, as well to hire new people if they're aware that they could lose their job um, due to a political process rather than how, they, how well they perform their position. Um, so these are all concerning. And um, so we're, we're still we're navigating the system. The state, of, um, the state League, in conjunction with several of our partners, um, have filed a lawsuit against SB202. So that is working its way through the courts. We don't expect to see a resolution anytime in the next year. Uh, discovery is going until November. So we've got a while before we know what the resolution is. And meanwhile, our county boards of elections and election supervisors have to figure out how to make elections work with, within the boundaries that they have been given. Um, on top of that, we have also got redistricting going on. Um, it's still happening here in Georgia. Um, our congressional seats, maps have been finalized and our state legislative seats have been finalized. But our local redistricting is still underway. Um, we have been told that it will be completed by Friday, this Friday, um, which is a very short period of time. Um, they began on January 10th or 11th, and they anticipate being done by the 18th. I know my county's maps still aren't done, and they're still arguing amongst themselves about what that what the county map should look like. Um, and this is really problematic, not just because um, it's such a rushed process, um, but because our uh, qualifying for our local elections it begins the first week of March, and we don't know yet who lives in what districts and who can run for what seats, and it's going to put an additional burden on our board of elections um, because they'll have to do all of the work you have to do when uh, redistricting takes place to determine what precincts, voting precincts, need to be um, where, you know, how to draw those lines to make sure that um, the precincts are equally distributed and not, you won't have one precinct that is overwhelmed with voters um, while another has, you know, 10 voters in it. Um, and so there's a lot of work that has to be done on that end. But on top of that, we are seeing that um, there's a lot of gerrymandering going on here in Georgia. And um, I think the most troubling issue with these, or these redistricting processes that are being rushed through right now. So there's no transparency. And we've seen in several counties, specifically Gwinnett County, which is just outside of the metro Atlantic or the outside of the perimeter um, around Atlanta and Cobb County, which is also part of the metro Atlanta area, um, which whose demographics have changed dramatically in the last few years and have become much more democratic leaning. Um, the Republican members of their delegation um, have taken over, have rejected the maps that were proposed by local um, county commissioners, um, which is our standard process here in Georgia, and have completely changed them and offered substitute districts that don't meet you know, basic criteria for fair redistricting and will basically undermine the ability of people of color to be adequately represented um, based on the numbers that they have in those communities. And it will just, you know, and it will also impact 
the political clout of parties. And I should note that this is not just a problem with Republicans in our state legislature. We also see Democrats um, playing fast and loose with the process. Um, my county, the reason we're not done is because one of our Democratic legislators has decided he doesn't like how our um, county commission districts are formed. And so he's going to push through his own way. Um, I, they're, they're still negotiating that, so that might not happen. But we, we see this happening with um, Democrats and Republicans. It is a problem um, on both sides. And so we've got a lot of work to do. And I think the biggest issue for us, um, in addition to us being down at the Capitol, our members are there um, arguing for fairness and transparency in this redistricting process. We argued vociferously against um, SB 202. Um, and we are arguing against additional bills that are being suggested this year, including doing away with absentee ballot drop boxes, um, because, we, we know that these are the things that are going to impact voter turnout. So we are fighting against them, um, but the deck is stacked against us. So I think going into our midterm, our, you know, our summer primaries and the November elections, our, our biggest goal is to get out the vote. Um, it might be harder for some people to vote, it, um, but our job is to make sure that our voters here in Georgia, regardless of party, understand where they can vote, how they can vote, when they need to you know, send in those absentee ballot requests or when they need to show up at the polls for early voting um, and where their polling places are once we know that um, after the redistricting process is done and you know, give them all the tools they need so that we actually have the voter turnout that we need um, so that people can actually elect uh, legislators county commissioners, whatever, who will uphold democracy. Um, we, we need to keep demanding that our legislators, who are those who are running to represent us, will embrace democratic principles of fairness and transparency um, and adequately represent us. So I, I know one of the things we're wondering is what can you do if you're not here in Georgia? We have get out the vote text drives and, and phone banks during the election season. So we'd love to have your help with that when that, that comes around. Um, and we're working closely with our partners at the state table here in Georgia, which is pro-Georgia, um, on a lot of these get out the vote drives. Um, so we Legal Women Voters of Georgia always welcomes donations, but pro-Georgia also helps fund a lot of the work that we do as well. So um, if you can't do phone banking or text banking, we would love donations. <laughs> so, um, I think that's it, unless there's any questions. Ruve, you're, um, muted actually. Uh, hi, there is a question in the Q&A. Um, the question is, have you had any experience with ranked choice voting, supporting more progressive outcomes? There are some people working on this here in Santa Barbara. So that is something um, we, we actually have uh, Better Out Georgia is working on ranked choice voting here in Georgia. That has not been um, something that the league, the state league has taken up. But we have seen actually that is something that came out of last year is um, overseas military do have the ability um, to do ranked choice voting because um, the other thing they did was to shorten the period of time between um, an election and a runoff election. Uh, it previously it had to coincide with federal rules, um, which uh, allows for more time. And now they've shortened that again for local or state elections. Um, so because it is so difficult sometimes to get ballots to overseas military um, 
in a timely fashion or anyone else who's voting overseas, they have um, installed uh, ranked choice voting for those ballots. Um, and so I don't know how well it worked in November, to be honest, but I know they're, they're sort of test driving it with our, our military personnel. Um, That's really interesting. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Scott. We're gonna move on and please uh, hold any other questions until the very end of the presentations. But I remember when I first heard about that law that was passed in Georgia, it made me very much want to go to Georgia during the general election and bring bottles of water to hand out and get arrested. I mean, it's just ridiculous some of the things that are happening. So um, let's move on. Our next speaker is Grace Shemaine. She is with the National, I mean, with the um, League of Women Voters of Texas. And, and I'm not on the right page, so <laughs> let me, Okay, um, she is a retired pediatric nurse practitioner. She joined the league in 2012 and has served on the state league's board since 2014. She specializes in the use of technology to support the league's mission of empowering voters and defending democracy. She currently serves as president of the state league and also chairs the advocacy committee. Ms. Shemaine. Hi, I'm, I'm so happy to be here with you guys today, uh, especially because uh, my mother grew up in Santa Barbara. So uh, her family is from there. Um, her last name was Kinsell. So if you know of any Kinsells, uh, they're probably related to me. So we spent many vacations in Santa Barbara. So I'm just thrilled to be here today. Um, so what, what is going on in Texas? Um, uh, just a bit of background first. Um, our Secretary of State is appointed uh, by the governor and is the chief election official. And then they're supposed to be um, approved by the Senate. We have 254 counties in Texas that run the actual election. That's 254 elections going on. The previous Secretary of State uh, was not brought actually to the Senate for confirmation by a vote uh, because um, the Secretary of State's office at that time declared the 2020 election safe and secure. And the office worked with us very closely to help make voting safe during that major COVID pandemic. So uh, for that, she did not get to continue in her job. So that's very frustrating. Uh, I do wanna let you know that we have five months of legislation every other year, thank goodness. This time we had the five months of legislation plus two, at least two extra sessions. I've put it out of my mind, I can't remember, uh, just to pass this incredibly massive uh, voter suppressive bill uh, called the SB1. Uh, the reason why it took so long is because uh, for one thing, the Senate changed the rules so that they did not have the, the number of Republicans and the number of Democrats, they did not have to work with each other. The Republicans did not have to work with the Democrats to try to make changes to the bill. So they changed the rules so that no nobody had to work with the Democrats. Uh, and then of course, in the our legislat legislators in the House, they didn't have enough people also to impact the legislation. So it was just moving straight through, uh, skipping many steps where we would be able to provide input. The, le the legislative session was going on last year about this time is when it was starting to really get into full force. But what was going on last year at that time? We were having a major COVID outbreak, you know? And who are the people who were impacted by COVID? Why? They're voters over, uh, over 
65, and voters with disabilities. Why is this important? They weren't able to go to the Capitol and provide testimony. It took a lot of effort of ours and others to make it so that they were able to provide some written testimony. A lot of that written testimony wasn't official, so it was not kept. Isn't that interesting? Just uh, so lovely. Uh, love Texas. So we need to build trust in our elections and not tear down our democracy, which is what I feel like is happening right now. Uh, so we fought desperately during the legislative session, which was set in the COVID pandemic. Um, people weren't able to go and provide testimony. We did, however, use something called an action alert system created by Soft Edge, which we loved, where folks were able to send over 200,000 action alerts. I mean, 200,000 emails. It was an action alert created by us and it automatically sent emails. People were so furious with this that they sent over 200,000 emails to their legislators. Uh, we also worked quietly. So we provided testimony in person with some people, some like two volunteers who would go to the Capitol at that time because they weren't enforcing the mask mandate and people weren't immunized fully immunized. Um, so we had two volunteers who would go and provide the testimony. Um, so it was very difficult. We also worked behind the scenes to try to make it better. So it went to the regular legislative session, the Democrats left, then it came in uh, and went to a special session. And then I think it might've gone to another special section, but it, I'm just, taking it out of my mind because so much is going on. Um, we worked also behind the scenes. So it's important because people here in Texas don't want to be seen as helping voters in any way, shape or form, right? Because they have names for this. Uh, it, they call it election integrity. We call it voter suppression. But often we use words instead here in Texas like the freedom to vote because that means much more to both Republicans and to Democrats and, and to the general public, the freedom to vote. Um, so what happened is um, then it when it finally got to the end, because of all those efforts and working behind the scenes, we were able to make some really important changes to the bill. So it was horrible when it started, the actual term, uh, that they used in one of the first bills was called the purity of the ballot. And if you're from anywhere knowledgeable about the South, then you would know exactly what that means. And it's a part of our constitution. Isn't that lovely? That happened after the civil war. So, uh, um, so he took, after he learned, after that uh, representative was explained that what that meant to most people, then uh, they removed that from the language of the bill. Thank goodness, which, you know, how very nice. Uh, so what is the impact of SB1? Oh, let, wait, first, what did SB1 actually do? Well, it threatens election officials with criminal prosecution for just doing their normal things that you would think that would help voters, such as explaining how to vote by mail, promoting vote by mail, sharing an application to vote by mail. We have to pay for our own applications for vote by mail now because they're not allowed to provide them anymore. Uh, threatening advocacy groups and individuals with felony prosecution for providing needed assistance to voters at, vote, at polling locations and with their mail ballot. So now if you are assisting somebody who is a voter with disabilities or a voter who speaks, a, speaks and reads another language and you're providing assistance, you have to take an oath that you will only read that ballot. You will not point at anything. You will not make any other indication of how that person should vote. Uh, uh, the poll watchers will be watching that carefully. Uh, and if you sign that oath, because they will 
uh, be able to send you to the attorney general uh, if you don't follow that rule. So that is a very, uh, it is something that may limit the number of assistance for voters with disability and voters who re don't read English or Spanish. Um, partisan poll watchers, which are the people who are supposed to go to the polls uh, and sort of watch over what's going on to make sure everything's going well. Now they could take election officials to court if they feel like that election officials kept them from being able to watch whatever they wanted to watch to court. Um, it requires voters using the mail ballot. We're going to go into this more because this is what's really impacting voters right now to include their ID number. And that ID number uh, on the application to vote by mail and on the ballot must be uh, associated with their voter registration number. And you may think to yourself, well, that's no big deal, yeah. Well, people in Texas are eligible to vote by mail if they are 65 and over, they are a voter with a disability. Those are the folks who can apply for an annual ballot by mail. If you're going to be out of the county or if you're in jail or the new law is if you're going to have a, if your due date for having a baby is three weeks before or three weeks after an election. So it impacts those folks. Who does it impact the most? It impacts voters, older voters, voters 65 and over and voters with a disability. And why is this important? Many older voters, especially those living in assisted living or in nursing homes, they're consistent voters. They have been uh, denied their right to vote because they do not have their ID with them. They are not driving and uh, they don't often, they don't have their social security cards with them. And so they're unable to provide their ID and also they are, this is a confusing application and a confusing ballot. And many of them are just not providing it because it has got so many uh, special places where they have to provide X's and, and uh, provide their numbers. Um, the bill also requires audits, which are disproportionately targeting populous counties. Uh, it prohibits outdoor voting, even if there's a natural disaster. You can't have a drive-through voting, which seemed like a natural fit for during COVID because we had drive-through uh, immunizations. Uh, and we don't have, there's only one place to drop off your vote by mail ballot in a county and it only is allowed to happen on election day and it must be the voter who drops it off and they must provide their ID. Hmm. It requires new procedures for purging lists of registered voters and threatening local officials with loss of employment and civil penalties for failing to maintain their voter lists. Um, one good thing, we've never had a cure process before for our uh, vote by mail uh, um, processes. And now we do have a little bit of a cure process. So now they have a way for you to uh, fix that ID. Uh, you could do it by logging onto a computer at votetexas.gov and inputting your social security number and your driver's license number. Hmm, where's the problem with that one? Because who's impacted it is the people who are 65 and over and people who uh, have voters who have a disability. Uh, many places in Texas don't even have broadband. Uh, not only do they not have uh, a computer at their home in order to do this. So uh, it's just one hurdle after another. Let's see. Oh, government officials are not, I think I might have already gone over that. Governor officials are not allowed to promote vote by mail or pay for uh, handing out vote by mail. Each voter has to call themselves to get the vote by mail application to be sent to them. So if your husband is in the room, he has to get on the phone and actually talk to them. You can't say, would you send me two, one for me, one for my husband? 
you have to, he has to get on the phone and ask for it himself. So they're not breaking the law and going to jail. So unfortunately, um, we've had this a high number, way higher. And I'm sorry, I don't know the numbers because we don't have that uh, ability uh, right now, is a high number of rejected absentee ballots due to this new voter, uh, new requirement for voter ID that the numbers must be associated with your registration. Let's see. And now, unfortunately, uh, we're one of the first uh, primaries. And now what we're seeing is that not only were the, the uh, applications about by mail being denied, but now the ballots are being denied because you must provide that voter ID number on your, uh, on your envelope where you send your uh, ballot in also. So voters are forgetting that it's not easy. Uh, so, this is, there, there are other things, but that's mainly what I wanted to go over because that's what's happening now. You might have heard about other issues with voter registration applications earlier in the month, but this moment, where this is what we're hearing. The next time uh, you may be hearing from me, it'll be about uh, the poll watchers and how they're impacting uh, voting at the polls. So we're just gonna have to watch and see how this plays out. Uh, what have we done to help with this is we have created videos, we have created uh, uh, handouts, we have leagues across Texas who have printed up their own vote by mail applications because leagues are allowed to share them. Uh, and uh, so we've done a lot of voter education and that seems to be helping for some people who are able to uh, get some help right now, but it does not help. I don't think it's going to make a difference in the future. The only future, the only difference will be making this, uh, uh, this go away. So we have to fix this election law so that these voters who have been consistent voters all their lives and suddenly have lost their ability to vote in this Texas primary. <coughs> I'm going to read you just a quick little thing. It's that this is from, so people send in their stories to me so that I, and I get permission to share. She said this, the first time I voted by mail was in 1964 when she was living in Germany. And now she's 79 and had voted by mail for several years. In addition to the age factor, I'm partially disabled. And this year for the first time, my application to vote by mail was rejected due to an ID number. The form asked for the Texas driver's license, which I supplied. But since she registered so long ago, the actual number she used was a social security number. Um, so she had a rejection notice sent to her and had to reapply again. And she was able to overcome those, those issues, but that is what we're dealing with right now. Uh, how can you help? I would say the only thing that would be helpful would be donations because calling our legislatures from out of state doesn't do much. So thank you for, so much for listening to me and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Ms. Shemaine. That was really helpful, um, but pretty depressing actually. <laughs> we have a lot of work left to do. So, um, Yes, let's go on to our next speaker and our third. And remember, we're holding all questions until after all three speakers have made their presentations. Our last speaker is the president-elect of the Arizona State League, Penny Shiori. She represents the State League as their designated volunteer lobbyist, supervising a team of five to seven lobbyists. She's been a league member since 2017. Ms. Shioran retired as a faculty member of the Maricopa County Community College District, where she taught computer science. She's been a fierce advocate for public funding of education, fair redistricting, and voting rights. She's also active in registering voters, is a deputy registrar for the Maricopa County Elections Department, and is a poll worker with the County Elections Department, serving as an inspector at polling locations. She has lived in Arizona for over 45 years and raised her children 
through Arizona's public school system. Welcome, Penny Shuren. Shuren. Thank you so much, uh, Rave, and the Santa Barbara League for inviting us. Um, uh, it's a hard hack to follow both Suzanne and Grace. Um, and unfortunately, I do not bring you much more good news from Arizona than uh, you have been hearing thus far. Um, before we start, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the lands of the 22 native um, tribes uh, and their stewardship of uh, the lands in Arizona. So this, um, in the time that I have, um, I, I wanna give you all a quick overview of what happened in 2021, what we're looking at in 2022. Um, unlike um, the luxury of some states, we have a legislative body that meets every year from January somewhere through May and passes legislation, often uh, numerous bills. Since 2016, we have seen a tremendous increase in the number of bills that are brought forward that either impact the rights of women, the rights of um, communities of color, the access to the ballot, uh, voting rights, etc. Now, before I get started with my section, I just want to make this particular comment. This year, the league in Arizona is monitoring 141 legislative uh, actions and legislation that is passing and being reviewed by committees in the Arizona state legislature. That's 141 bills specifically on voting, voting rights, elections, and ballot initiatives. In addition to that, the total number of bills being passed this year or being considered this year is close to about 1,800 bills. Um, we don't get a reprieve. Uh, it's every year from January through May. And so the work of the League in Arizona is intense for the first quarter. And we could not do it if we did not have the kind of commitment we do from our volunteer league. So quickly jump into um, Arizona. Um, what I would like to cast this as is, you know, we talk about dying a thousand, uh, you know, dying a thousand deaths to multiple cuts. Here, what we have is uh, an effort to kill democracy with a thousand spears of bad legislation. And that's what we have been seeing since 2021. Uh, there was a question about, is this because of the 2020 election and the big lie? As you all know, <clears throat> we were ground zero for a sham audit. So, of course, this is all continuing to promote excuse me, the big lie, and to continue to promote the notion that our elections were somehow <clears throat> um, um, fraudulent. So what happened in 2021? <clears throat> the, the types of the um, legislation that were passed could be classified under these buckets. First is to impede election administration criminalizing election officials, and you heard this in Georgia and Texas, making it a class five or a class six felony, one of the highest uh, um, issues, uh, felony charges, uh, and just for administering certain election procedures. Bans from counties for utilizing private grants to run their election or register voters. Voter purges. Now, this is not necessarily this year, we're seeing a lot more of voter, voter purges of the actual voter registration rolls. What I'm going to talk about something that is very dear to Arizonans, and that is the, the, um, the list that allows Arizona voters to get an early ballot without having to apply. In 2007, the legislature passed uh, what was known as the Permanent Early Voting List Law. And what that allowed a voter to do is to sign up for the list and receive a ballot regardless of, um, you know, whether they voted or not. Well, um, last year, that particular bill was amended and it was amended so that it's now called the Active Early Voting List. And it essentially purges a voter from the list if they did not use the mail-in ballot. 
They can stay on the list. They can receive the ballot. But once they did not use the mail-in ballot in two back-to-back primary and general elections, they will be removed from the list. As a point of data, 80% of Arizonans, 88% of Arizonans used the early voting um, mail-in ballots in the August primary in 2020, and about 80% received and utilize the ballot either by mailing it back or dropping it off in mail uh, in ballot boxes. Now, I want to take a minute to explain what the use means. So if you received a ballot and you decided to go to a polling location and you decided you wanted to vote a standard in-person ballot, then you would be a person who did not use the mail-in ballot. And so in 2020, because of the big lie, We saw numerous voters come in and instead of dropping off the mail ballot, say to us, "Um, I want to vote in person. Give me a standard ballot. Well, that action will count against that voter. And if they did it two back to back primary and general elections, then they would have uh, an issue. Additionally, this disenfranchises our independent voters in Arizona, independent voters do not automatically get a ballot for a partisan primary election. They have to request it, but they are on the early voting list. So they would have one count against them for not having used a mail-in ballot or even requesting a mail-in ballot. So we have, um, so this is an area that is going to be put to the voters. So we have, uh, there's a campaign Uh, to repeal this as a referendum to the voters and to bring back the permanent early voting list. The other is to make it harder to vote, which would require voters to put the date of birth, the driver's license, or last four digits of the social security number on an early ballot. And it requires that the ballots be returned in mail, uh, returned in person, so you don't, you cannot return it by mail and no ballot boxes. Now, none of these passed, however, they're back this year and they seem to be moving at a fast clip. The other um, um, attacks on our freedom was to decertify the election results. As you all know, one of the efforts was the sham audit to decertify the election results, okay? And this year, they tried to bring this last year, but this year it's back again, which is the state legislature can decide the presidential election by decertifying the results. And the way they're going about it is to have numerous bills that would decertify equipment after the elections, thus leading to the decertification of the results. They would decertify an equipment because the paper wasn't the right paper, it wasn't printed right, numerous reasons for doing that. Um, the other um, um, uh, the other area of attack is changing the certification process, that the state legislature would certify an election instead of the Secretary of State, and then that the state legislature select the electors. Now, as you all know, uh, a lot of this was fueled by the sham election review and none of those reviews, and it's really not an audit because there were many proper audits done. None of those reviews really yielded um, any support or any uh, confirmation of the claims of fraud. So what are these sham election reviews? This is nothing more than a new way and a strategy to undermine the elections by losing campaigns. And we have legislation coming through that will allow losing campaigns to automatically call for these kind of reviews. It is a concerted national effort. You heard uh, about this in Texas and Georgia. We also have um, the issue of election integrity units being formed that are essentially developed to intimidate intimidate voters and thwart participation. So, 2022, what should we? Uh, what are we facing? Um, in addition to reminding everybody that we are following 141 bills, and we testify every week. In fact, one of our volunteer lobbyists is testifying on six bills today in committee hearings. So in addition to testifying and fighting back, these are what we see. These are the buckets of bills that are being presented and are being reviewed by committees. 
And uh, we're doing everything we can to stop that. One is to chill voter re registration. Two very problematic bills for us at the league. One is the requirement that someone who registers voter has to first get a notarized affidavit stating that they are going to be registering 25 voters or more. That is every single individual. So every single volunteer in the league will need to do something like this. We don't know where it'll go, but it is a problem. The second problem is that um, the county recorders themselves are not permitted to do voter registration outside of their county uh, buildings. And in the past, county recorders have organized voter registration drives in many different venues. And many of us as deputy registrars have participated in those. The next one is criminalizing election officials and new ways to sabotage elections. This is a really, really crazy plan and very, very um, worrisome. So uh, I've been asked to slow down as those who know me, uh, it's a little hard, but I will try my very best. So the criminalizing of elections is really a worrisome area because it means that it would put fear into our neighbors and our friends, all of who might be interested in working as election workers, who might wonder if they might make a mistake of dropping a ballot on the floor or placing a ballot in the wrong location, whether they might be, uh, you know, they might be uh, in jail. So this is something that is very worrisome because it will impact uh, the county recorder's abilities to hire poll workers, which means it will impact the possibility of having many polling locations in the places where they will decide not to have polling locations are where we have voters, um, larger number of voters, and often voters, um, uh, communities of color and in tribal communities. Uh, so attacks on citizens' initiatives. This is one the league really gets upset about because we believe so strongly in direct democracy and the right of citizens to initiatives, which is enshrined in the Arizona constitution and has been part of our constitution since the birth of Arizona as a state. Extra voter ID everywhere um, and res restricting vote by mail drop boxes in the early voting list. This is sort of the bucket if you will, of bills that we are following and that we are working to testify against, speak out against, and mobilize our members. So then the question is, what are we fighting for? We're fighting for peace at the polls. What this means is that we want our poll workers, our volunteers, we want observers, we want anyone who is willing to give their time to ensure that voters can vote, know that they will be safe, that the experience that the voter has in order to vote is a peaceful experience. This is really important for us as the league. What we stand for is freedom to vote without intimidation, register to vote any time prior to the deadline without facing barriers, access the ballot in person and by mail, no matter where you live, what language you speak or what physical abilities you have, Nonpartisan counting of ballots and respect for the results. Privacy of individual election information and easy access to public information. Respect for tribals, uh, tribal rights in consultation with tribes about elections. Now the question is what can we do about this and what are we doing about this? There is a ballot measure bring, brought forth by a large coalition of voting rights organization. The goal is to collect signatures to put it to the voters. It's called Arizonans for Fair Elections. The goal is to protect the permanent early voting list, make sure that voter registration can be updated at the DMV or the Motor Vehicle Division, extends in-person early voting, requires tribal input on polling places, ensures various voting methods, voter registration through election day, protects right to offer food, water, and voter in line at polling places. Also protects the legislature from overturning elections, protects privacy of ballots, provides funding for elections infrastructure, protects ballot measure petition signatures from being disqualified. And then there's some um, dark money issues. Now, you know, um, 
national legislation has not passed, but at the state level, it seems that in Arizona, we have to do what we need to do to ensure these bad laws aren't um, actually, they can't be enacted or enforced. So as a league, a couple of things we are focusing on. One is to increase participation as poll workers, you know, getting out the vo vo uh, getting out the information to our members, mobilizing volunteers to be part of the election protection activities, increasing registering voters, get out the vote campaign starting now using the voter access network, especially since we are done with redistricting informing the voters whose districts have changed that they've changed so that they are starting to pay attention to what that will impact in terms of who they can vote for and school districts and other, um, um, other um, resources that their communities count on so that they can vote on those. And mobilizing citizens to speak out and hold legislators accountable. In Arizona, we have a wonderful system called the request to speak system, though right now, a lot of us are unhappy because it's a little slower than we like it to be. A request to speak system is a citizen's opportunity to actually speak out against any of the legislation that is being heard in a committee. So right now we have many, many of our league members and the public speaking out against so many of these bills using the request to speak system. With that, I will stop sharing my screen and um, open up to questions as appropriate. We're gonna send you all the email addresses for all of the speakers so that you can follow up with them individually. There's the slide with their email addresses on it. And again, I apologize for that, but we just ran a little long and we're going to Move on to Beth Pitt in August. Okay. Thank you to all of our speakers. We now have a clearer picture of the work that needs to be done throughout the entire country. And I'm a little depressed about all of this, but we'll do what we can. We go to the LWVUS website. It's lwvus.org. And they have a lot of information about what you can do. We're also going to be sending an email to all the attendees of this forum with a list of national organizations that are working to stop voter suppression and things that you can do directly if you want to do more. Now, for those registered for this event, I'd like to introduce Beth Pitt in August, who joined the League of Women Voters of Santa Barbara in 2005. She has served as League Secretary, Co-President, and Liaison to the Santa Barbara Pro-Choice Coalition, and briefly served on the State League's board. Just the beginning is her first film, a project born out of passion for women's rights and her ad admiration for longtime League members. She will tell us about her film and show us a sneak peek, which is about 20 minutes long, I apologize to anyone who didn't register for the event and cannot see this film, Sneak Peek, but you can uh, use the information on the slide to contact her and get information. So welcome, Beth. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to share our film, Just the Beginning, A Century of Political Power in the League of Women Voters. I'd like to start by thanking the League of Women Voters and the League of Santa Barbara for their support. And uh, thanks to my fellow League members for inspiring the story, including those that have participated in the film, like our panelist, Grace Shameen. And I wish to thank all the generous donors that have contributed to the film including the Santa Barbara Women's Political Committee and AAUW in addition to the League. I also am pleased to introduce producer and editor Edward C. Bartell II, who is here with us from Atlanta in the Peach State uh, with uh, our other panelists, Susanna. With a goal to premiere this year in 2022, uh, we are close to picture lock and currently focusing on a finishing funds campaign and identifying potential distribution partners. At this critical time for our democracy and women's equality, just the beginning will inspire audiences to use their power, vote, get involved and make a difference on issues they care about. 
as a work that connects history to the present day with an accessible and entertaining approach, the film will uh, be both a catalyst during this midterm election year and an enduring work to spark civic engagement and women's leadership for years to come. If you're interested to learn more and get involved, please contact me at bath at intersectionstv.com or visit our website. With apologies to those who were live streaming via Facebook, uh, because our film is a work in progress, this is a private screening. Thus, uh, the recording and live stream is turned off. Now, our preview of just the beginning. Thanks to everyone for coming. Stay safe and look for the emails that we're gonna be sending to all registered attendees with the names and email addresses for the speakers and also the list of national organizations you can contact to get involved, the ones who are fighting voter suppression. Thank you all. Have a great evening.